one of these days I'm going to be perfectly on time. But thank you very much for tuning in. This is the daily reading question. And today um, I've completely forgotten what it is, but I'm going to read it out straight away. And um, then I'm going to do feedback from yesterday's. You can see all of these videos in a little playlist, which is in the description. Um, if you want to go back and look at the question before looking at this one and seeing the answers. But this one is about Hubble's law. OK, so Hubble's law is evidence for the universe uh, being around 14 billion years old. Describe how Hubble was able to take the measurements that he did. Explain how Hubble's data provides evidence for the expanding universe. Now, the A-level idea this time, and have a go at these guys, because the A-level ones are really tricky. Ensure that your discussion involves how the H Hubble constant is taken from a graph and how this relates to the age of the universe. So really quickly again, Hubble's always evidence for the universe being 14 billion years old, approximately. Describe how Hubble made his measurements. Explain how his data provides evidence for the expanding universe. It's in the description as well. The A of light ideas ensure your discussion involves how Hubble constant is taken from a graph and how it relates to that, the age of the universe. So it's a really interesting one. Hubble is definitely on both uh, GCSE and A level, and I find it a really fascinating part. So have a little go of it, enjoy looking around it, and make sure you get these definitions down. It is one of the hardest kind of topics they could do, and that would cover quite a lot of different areas. So I'm finding these really, really useful, and people found the last one really tricky, so that's really, really good. I was thinking they were getting a bit easy, so I've been writing some hard ones. Oh, come on, Lane, come on, give it a go. OK, I will. Um, if you've got any questions, by the way, during this video, then uh, just put them in the live comments and I'll come back to them at the end. This had a really hard GCSE one, OK, really hard, uh, sorry, A-level aspect to it. This question from yesterday it was about gas pressure, uh, why temperature increases when you pump up a tyre. And Harriet and Rachel both did amazing responses. For a GCSE level, their response is really, really great. OK, I'm really rooting for you guys. I'm sure with the hard work you're putting in with these things, it's going to pay off. It's going to get you to grade nine because, you know, we're doing hard questions here because, well, this channel is all about getting the grade nines and the A stars. So I'm trying to write you some tricky ones to really get you thinking. Really impressed with them. Rachel's one, I'm just going to kind of give it um, almost verbatim back to you as feedback because it's that good. So. Uh, Essentially, work is done on the gas is the first part. And this transfers kinetic energy, therefore, to the air molecules inside. Yeah, Harriet's shows were excellent as well. Um, so essentially, the work is done on the gas, so the temperature rises as the kinetic energy of the molecules increases. So um, temperature is the average kinetic energy of a molecule. Now. I'm going to go through the A-level derivation of that to show, because that was the A-level idea, show that the um, temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy. Oh, is that good? OK. Um, so this explains why the uh, walls of the hand pump get hot and why the walls of the tyre get hot. Now, there's also a greater number of molecules inside there. And so there's a greater number of molecules with more kinetic energy. And so they collide more with each other and the inner wall of the tyre. That's the second part there. The colliding with the inner wall of the tyre means it's doing a larger force on that wall. So Rachel then goes on to talk about uh, the area of the tyre is fixed. So from pressure equals force over area, the greater force acting at right angles to the tyre wall will increase the pressure on the tyre, making it harder to depress. So there's a larger force from the inside of the tyre on to the outside. So if you were trying to push in, then you need a larger force to overcome that force and do a resultant force to make the tyre depress. Fantastic. Why is this not a contradiction of Boyle's law? Both um, girls got that one as well. It's because the temperature is increasing as well. And also, this is not, I don't think either of them did get, because you're also getting more molecules in there, then Boyle's law doesn't apply. Boyle's law means pressure times volume is a constant, or pressure and volume are inversely proportional. It's another way of saying the same thing. Pressure times volume is a constant, given the constant temperature and given a fixed mass of gas. So if the temperature changes, then Boyle's law doesn't apply. So um, I'm just going to restate the, uh, this next question, OK? And then I'm going to go through the A-level bits. Uh, GCSE students, if, you're, you know, if you want to skip the A-level bit, then do. Um, I will come back to the live chat at the end if there is anything. But um, 
I think this is an A-level question anyway. So if you want to skip the A-level bit, then do. But it's, in, it's interesting, maybe have a go, because it's going to skill you up to get you to that uh, grade nine level, the kind of algebraic skills. But this is one of the harder derivations that there are. So before you go for GCC, Hubble's law is uh, evidence for the universe being around 14 billion years old. Describe how Hubble was able to take the measurements that he did and explain how Hubble's data provides evidence for the expanding universe. And the A-level ideas are explain how, um, explain how uh, Hubble's constant is taken from a graph and how that relates to the age of the universe. Okay, so derivation of why um, temperature is proportional to kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So this is called statistical physics. So we, we talk about an individual molecule and then we scale it up to many molecules. So imagine one gas molecule within a box, within a room or something like that. The room has dimensions X, Y, and Z. Um, now this molecule is moving to the left initially, um, let's say with a speed minus U. It's going to collide with this face of the box and therefore it's going to do a momentum change of 2MU. So it has a mass, has initial speed U, so its momentum change, its delta P is 2MU. Uh, now, a force is a rate of change of momentum. We talked about that one last time. That's Newton's second law. So we're deriving from first principles, Newton's laws being one of those. Um, OK, so we know we've got a way to work out the force. But how are we going to know the time, the time of that collision? Well, we don't need to know the actual time of that collision. But if we scale it up to many, many, many particles, then on average, we can think about there being an average force of... Um, <laughs> I've been blooming distracted by this comment. <laughs> Thank you. We'll, we'll talk for a minute. Um, <laughs> an average force or an average time per collision, if you like, of uh, t time being 2x over u. Now, this is a bit confusing where this comes from. This is the distance um, that has gone there and back between collisions divided by the speed that it has u. So now I've got an expression for the time, the average time between collisions on this face. So substitute that into my equation for force, and I get the force on the face x is mu squared over x. So just imagine that going in like upside down, and then do the cancellation, and you get this expression here. Force on the x face is mu squared over x. OK? Now then, now we want to generalize and start talking about pressure. So pressure is force over area. That's our expression for force, OK? Now, that, just remember, we've got to this point. You can watch this back and get to this point again if you like. We've got an expression for force, and we know that force over area is a pressure. And we're talking about this one face of our box, and that area is y times z. So that force, that expression, over yz leads to this equation here. So pressure is mu squared over xyz, because, well, we've just done yz times this thing, and we've got xyz on the bottom. xyz, xyz is the volume of the box. So now I've got a volume in there. Now, the reality is that those molecules are not all going in a nice orderly way, one side of the wall to the other side of the wall and back. The reality is they're going in all different directions. So we have to have a kind of average speed. And when we're talking about things going in different directions, then if we average them, then on average they'll sum to zero. So, but we know that's not the case. They're, they're, we want an average speed, not an average velocity, if you like. So we use this expression here called a mean square speed. So this is the mean square speed in the x dimension, u. And there are a number of particles, n. So we've essentially just talked talk about the total pressure being n times our expression for the individual pressure caused by one particle. And the reality is, again, that they're not all colliding with that wall. Only a third of them are colliding with that wall. So our total force, our total pressure, if you like, is the sum of all the different pressures in, in all the different dire, uh, dimensions. Now, this is an equation for total pressure. So the actual pressure is um, 3p is equal to the sum of all the different pressures. So each, basically, this is the pressure in the x. Pressure in the y, pressure in the z has exactly the same equation, but the speed is in different dimension. So u, rather than u, we're going to use w, and we're going to use v for y and z. And this is a bit I think people get confused, where we're relating the mean square speed in all dimensions, c, to um, all the, the sum of the mean square speeds in the individual dimensions. So now we've got an expression which has 
the number of particles um, related to the pressure, related to the mass, and their average speeds squared and all over the volume. Now, just to tidy up, put it all on one line, I'm going to do uh, PV equals M NMC squared. Now, C squared is just all this difference, all this stuff here. And I'm going to move the free across to this line here. So I now have free PV is NMC squared. And you can see now, you can feel close because we, we feel like we're close to this idea of kinetic energy. We've got something in there that's related to average kinetic energy. But where are we going to get temperature from? Well, where else have you seen PV? You've seen it in, haha, the ideal gas equation. So that's another first principle. Pressure times volume is equal to the number of particles times the Stefan Boltzmann constant, sorry, the Boltzmann constant, rather, times by the absolute temperature, so temperature in Kelvin. So again, um, all I'm doing now is I'm making an expression from the previous side. I'm making that equal to NKT, so PV we had and I'm making that equal to NKT. And then all I'm going to do is tidy up by moving the three across, so I get three KT. And then I'm gonna divide both sides by two because we know that kinetic energy is a half MC squared, and I'll just divide both sides by two so the sides are still equal. And now I've got something where I've got temperature being proportional to the average kinetic energy, which is what I aim to do. So that question was all about work done on a gas cause an increase in temperature and the explanation of which means to say, really, you're doing work on the gas, so you're increasing the kinetic energy of the particles. And kinetic energy, the average kinetic energy, is proportional to temperature. So if the kinetic energy of the particles goes up, then the temperature goes up. This is the algebra. This is the statistical physics for um, you know, working through that to work that equation out, which you're pretty sure you get given that equation on your equation sheet. So you need to be able to use these equations. but being able to derive them from first principles is something they could ask you to do. And it's going to be one of those really tricky questions that you need to get some of those up. Um, you need to get some of those to that point. You need to be able to get some marks in something like that. Right. Um, so, everybody, I'm going to have a quick look at the chat. Then I'll repeat the question one last time. Um, and then I will go and I wish you all good. Um, good. I wish you all good, happy weekend, have a nice weekend. Right, um, electromagnetism seems to be one of the hardest topics in my class, myself included. Can we have an electromagnetism question or two? Thanks. Yes, certainly can. I will do some electromagnetism questions um, in the next few live feeds for you. That's not a problem at all. My pleasure. What else have we got? Um, wh why is the generator effect... Uh, sorry, why is it that for the generator effect when the coil is parallel to the magnetic field, the EMF is minimum and the flux is zero. When the coil is perpendicular, the flux is maximum and the EMF is zero. So when the coil is perpendicular, then you do get a you get a maximum um, EMF. It's about the it's about the amount of um, flux that the coil kind of uh, sweeps out. So if you imagine a coil in space, okay, just a coil of wire, then um, I'll use something. I don't know how to use this book. So imagine this is a coil of wire, okay? Then, and you imagine all the magnetic flux is going this way along here. So at the minute it's 90 degrees, so it's sweeping up the largest possible amount of flux that it can. If we rotate it, then it sweeps out less and less and less and less and less and less and less flux. And when it is parallel to the field, it sweeps out no flux at all. Okay, and what that is, is, is a sign relationship, okay? With sine of 90 being a maximum and sine of zero being zero. So um, this is why we call magnetic field strength really flux density. So if you imagine all those lines of flux through space, it's how much flux there is per meter. And the Tesla is a Weber per meter squared. So if you think about the, the flux actually, that, that's kind of you know, interacting with the coil, that's, that's uh, being swept out, that's being um, taken up by the coil, it's a maximum at 90 degrees and it's zero at um, at zero degrees. I hope that makes sense. It's, it, loads of things vary with the sign of an angle. Uh, I've got a good video about that with intensity and angle, which you might want to have a little book and find. I have a lovely hairstyle. Hope you remember me. May God bless you the way you should say. All right, hashtag. Thank you very much. Um, I do remember you from a previous year, hashtag. I, I, I didn't, um, I, did you finish last year then? Because I think you were hanging out on the live feeds last year. It was my pleasure. Um, I get my hair cut. I spend a lot of money on my on my hair, but I also don't. I also go quite a long time between haircuts, so 
in a minute is kind of, I kind of like it at this point, um, but uh, I think my wife's probably looking at me thinking, I'm going to get you a haircut pretty soon. So we'll do some electromagnetism stuff soon. For someone who can who hardly lose any marks in maths, why is year 13 maths so hard? Yeah, good question. I remember it being quite tricky maths. I'm not sure if cyclotrons are in the AQA syllabus. They're not in, um, they're not in, uh, <laughs> thanks hashtag. They're not in GCSE, I'm, I'm certain of that, but um, they're certainly very interesting and they're, they're a good use. They're, cyclotrons, um, particle accelerators, particle detection are a good um, combination of Fleming's left hand rule and circular motion. So bear, bear that in mind because you've got a moving particle, so you've got a current, you've got a field, and you're causing a force, and so you can make something accelerate into a circle. Very, very useful. Cyclotrons are very compact. They can be sort of watch-sized. Uh, very compact uh, particle accelerators. And, um, uh, you know, the, the, the simpler way of doing it where you don't accelerate a particle in, in a circle, a linear accelerator, gets very, very long very quickly because after a few kicks, then, in fact, the electron gun in my lab will get it up to like 10%, an electron uh, up to about 10% of the speed of light. So, you know, you can think about that as being the first stage in a linear accelerator. Linear accelerators get very, very long very quickly, and then you have to start accounting for the curvature of the Earth and things like that in, in your particles. So you might as well accelerate particles in, in a circle. Larger rings for larger energies, hence uh, the LHC at CERN. Sorry for distracting you during an explanation. That's okay. It was hard enough as it was, hashtag, okay? Uh, it is literally my bogey derivation. It's the one that I always uh, struggle with. Um, can I do a video on all the LXL practicals? Have already. Did a live feed last year. If you Google um, uh, you know, all the LXL core practicals, you will find my video, I'm sure. I'll just put Gorilla Physics in there as well, and you'll find it. Um, how about the next cube being about particle accelerators? Yep, I, um, it is true that uh, it's not really on GCC, so maybe GCCs can kind of, or can, I, I can maybe do a little GCC tiny bit of it or something. Lewis Matheson has a great video on practicals in 14 minutes. Sorry, could, but I know you think he is. He is a legend. He is, absolutely is a legend. Um, last year, we did some uh, we did live feeds like one after the other, and it was really exciting. So we did, I did half an hour, then he did half an hour, then he, he, I did half an hour, then he did half an hour. So yeah, it's, it's lovely working with him. Um, we give each other lots of shouts out and everything like that. Uh, he's got a bigger channel than me, and I admire him because of the way he's, he's made. He made sure he's covered the entire syllabus, whereas I kind of, you know, I start doing one thing, then I get kind of, I get, well, I don't get bored because I enjoy my, my work, I enjoy physics, I enjoy making videos, but I, I struggle to kind of see things, um, you know, all, all the way through. I get good ideas and then I, um, then I do half of them and then get another good idea. All right, everybody, I am going to go. I'm going to leave you to it. Happy weekend. Have a go at the next one. Hubble's Law, okay. Um, yeah, yeah I, I tend to do all the um, encouragement stuff, Lane, is my kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's my, my bag is uh, encouragement and study skills and everything like that. I, I like talking about physics as well, so I do that as well. And I do want to, at some point, I'm going to do, um, I'm going to do as much as possible. I'm going to, I'm going to really sit down and be like Lewis, be more, a bit more Lewis. Hubble's law is evidence for the universe being 14 billion years old. Describe how Hubble was able to take the measurements he did. Explain how Hubble's, Hubble's data provides evidence for the expanding universe. And the A-level ideas are, ensure your discussion involves how Hubble's constant is taken from a graph and how this relates to the age of the universe. Dudes, have a nice weekend. Think about um, Hubble. I'm glad. I have a physics, <laughs> a physics mantra, physics all day, every day. What are you doing this year then, hashtag? Are you, um, is, was last year GCSE and this is A-level or uh, are you at university? What's going on? You can leave that in the main comments if you like.